Viking, the very word epitomizes adventure and ferocity. Though not the most technologically advanced culture of their period, the Vikings nevertheless saw more of the world than virtually any other group. The Viking spirit drove them constantly to push beyond the next horizon. From their northerly homelands in Scandinavia, Vikings took to the rivers and seas. They drove east into Russia, reaching Constantinople and Baghdad. To the west, they assailed the coastlines of Europe and created colonies in Scotland, England, Ireland, and France. Vikings explored the Mediterranean, attacking Italy and Muslim territories in Spain and North Africa. Most impressive of all, Vikings crossed the Atlantic, establishing bases in Iceland and Greenland. They even explored North America, centuries before the expeditions of Columbus. The 9th and 10th centuries were perilous times, and it was against a backdrop of rising and falling empires that the Vikings adventured. For most peoples, Vikings were terrifying. The sight of their dragon-headed longships on the horizon struck terror into many a villager. The Anglo-Saxons of the British Isles, the Carolingian Franks, and even the Muslims of Cordoba all battled Viking raiders and all experienced shock at the swiftness and daring of their attacks. But Vikings weren't all violent raiders. Many of them were merchants and settlers. They engaged in trade from Baghdad to England and formed alliances with local rulers. Most notably, a band of Vikings joined the bodyguard of the great emperors of Byzantium. Vikings were brilliant metalworkers and craftsmen. Their longships remain impressive to this day. For every Viking who returned home rich with plunder, many others died in battle, or perished of disease in squalid military camps, or drowned in violent sea storms. These men risked everything for land, wealth, and fame. Their ethos prized courage over all else. Norse religion contrasted greatly with the monotheism of Christianity and Islam, which stressed submission to the supreme being and avoidance of sin. Viking gods were divine warriors, and life was a contest of valor. For the Norse, an immense ash tree named Yggdrasil lay at the heart of the universe. Yggdrasil's branches spread throughout the heavens, binding together the realms of the gods, frost giants, fire giants, elves, dwarves, men, and the underworld. At the dawn of creation, Odin and the first gods slew the giant Ymir. The gods formed the world as an immense flat circle divided into three regions, each with its own inhabitants, but all centered by the core of Yggdrasil. The giants were banished to the outer edges, called Jotunheim, from where they plotted revenge for the killing of Ymir. From Ymir's eyelashes, the gods constructed a great fortress to hold the giants at bay, forming the middle realm, called Midgard. While walking along the primordial shore, Odin and his brothers came upon two logs washed up by the sea. From these, they fashioned Ask and Embla, the first man and woman. The gods gave Midgard to man as his home. For themselves, they took the central domain, the celestial kingdom of Asgard, home of the Aesir. Asgard reveals much about Viking attitudes. Asgard was the great hall of a celestial warrior king, a place for the gods to feast and hold court. From his great throne, Odin watched over the entire universe. Like the chieftains that honored him, Odin presided over his own household of warriors, the Einheriar, the bravest fighters fallen in battle. They dwelt in Valhalla, Odin's home, the house of the slain, a vast hall of gold with spears for rafters and a roof made from shields and armor. Each morning, the Einheriar marched out to fight and die in great battles. In the evening, they were magically healed and then returned to Valhalla to feast on mead and meat, only to march out again for more war the following day. The Einheriar were attended by Valkyries, beautiful female spirits clad in armor. At Odin's order, the Valkyries flew down to the battlefields of Earth to conduct the bravest of the fallen to Valhalla. Courage earned a Viking a place in Odin's household. For the Norse, Odin in particular was associated with wisdom. His gifts to man were the runes, poetry, and prophecy. Odin himself was relentless in his search for wisdom. Once, he allowed himself to be hung from Yggdrasil for nine days to uncover the secrets of the runes. 
However, the most popular god was Odin's son, Thor, god of thunder, who protected men from giants with his magical hammer. Small Thor hammers were worn as protective amulets by travelers. Of the goddesses, the most widely invoked were probably Thor's wife, Frigg, called upon by women in childbirth, and Freya, goddess of love, beauty, and fertility. The location of Midgard conveys the Norse sense that humanity exists between the order of the gods and the elemental chaos of Utgard, the outer world. Between Midgard and Utgard lay the sea, inhabited by an enormous serpent, which encircled the world and bound it together by biting its own tail. Yggdrasil's heights reached to the sky, and its roots penetrated a subterranean well called Urd's Well, where the gods held their assemblies. Yggdrasil symbolized the cyclical nature of life bringing water up from the well and dispensing it throughout the cosmos. The universe of Asgard, Midgard, and Utgard, with Yggdrasil at the core, mirrors the Norse conception of their own society. At the center stood the farmhouse, ringed by the cultivated land, with dangerous wilderness lying beyond. Although Utgard was chaotic and frightening, it was understood to contain the elemental matter necessary for creation and the discovery of wisdom. And so the Vikings journeyed beyond the Midgard of their homes to penetrate the far-flung chaos of the seas, eager for discovery. A Norse family cultivated near their house a house tree, a symbolic core representing Yggdrasil and the stability and centrality of the household. Historian Robert Ferguson writes, Whatever else it was, northern heathendom was not the absence of a culture. Viking Age Scandinavians had their own cosmology, their own astronomy, their own gods, their own social structure, their own forms of government, and their own notions of how best to live and to die. By the middle of the 8th century, changes and growth in Scandinavia were bubbling over and would produce the burst of activity, including the incredible seafaring journeys that would come to define the Viking centuries. From the moment he became king of the West Saxons, Alfred the Great was confronted with the mortal threat of the Vikings. But Alfred had considerable experience as a commander, having fought alongside his brother, the late King Athelred. In addition, Alfred was plagued throughout his life by a medical infirmity, described by the king's friend and biographer, Bishop Asser. Today, historians believe this may have been Crohn's disease, a chronic illness that can go into remission for long periods, but is terribly painful during flare-ups. Despite this ailment, Alfred was a very active and dutiful ruler. The condition did not prevent him from fathering children. Joanna Arman estimates that Alfred's first child and firstborn daughter, Athelflaed, was born around this time, in roughly 870. Alfred the Great was crowned during a period of profound turmoil. To the English of the time, it must have seemed like the end of days. The Vikings had destroyed all but two of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Britain. Kings had been martyred, houses of God had been despoiled, monasteries left in ruins. The thriving trade of the 8th century had broken down. Learning was at a low point. Alfred would later complain that south of the River Humber, there was scarcely a literate priest left. A month after Alfred the Great took the throne in 871, he faced two Viking armies on the battlefield near Wilton. The Viking coalition was formidable indeed, its ranks multiplied by the presence of the Great Summer Army. In this engagement, the Anglo-Saxons were defeated, and Alfred concluded that he could not eliminate the immediate threat to his kingdom without buying off the invaders. This was an old but never permanent solution to Viking attacks. It often only invited further hostility, and increasingly Alfred was not capable of maintaining this financially ruinous policy. The king's own estates could not produce the Dane Guild, and so it had to be raised from the people of Wessex and from church estates. The following year, the great heathen army took steps to consolidate their gains. Under the Viking chieftain Halfton, they moved into Mercia. Here, the Vikings set up base in Repton during the winter of 873-74. 
Northumbria and East Anglia were already under their control. In the past, Wessex had brought aid to Mercia, but not this time. The Mercians were powerless to overcome the Danes. King Burgred and his wife were deposed and went into exile. Burgred fled to Rome, where he died the following year. His wife, King Alfred's own sister, finished her days in a nunnery. Never again would an independent king rule Mercia. Instead, the Danes established their own puppet ruler. The following year, the Danish host divided. Halfton marched north to consolidate power in Northumbria. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle simply states, Halfton shared out the lands of the Northumbrians, and they proceeded to plow and support themselves. This passage has invited much debate. Did the Vikings seize land from the locals, or did they purchase estates from native lords with the treasure now weighing down their coffers? Whatever the case, it's clear that Halfton's company settled in York as a permanent home. Here the land was fertile, and opposition non-existent. This was an ideal place for these Danish adventurers to settle in and put down roots. Place names of the region today indicate the mixing of Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon language. As the former raiders became cultivators of the land, there was also an interaction of peoples, even cooperation and trade. Vikings were marrying into the local population. And it was not just warriors arriving from the Scandinavian homeland. There is evidence that the Danes were bringing their women with them as well, another sign that the Vikings were settling in as farmers and no longer acting as mere raiders. Meanwhile, the summer host under Guthrum remained in Mercia. They established a base at Cambridge for the year. Guthrum's ambitions were now focused on the final unconquered territory in England, Wessex. In 876, Guthrum's army entered the kingdom. They evaded Alfred's army, seizing Wareham in Dorset. At first, Alfred besieged the enemy in their stronghold. He was forced to withdraw when he learned of a large Viking fleet cruising along the coast of Wessex, intent on reinforcing Guthrum. Once again, the king had to negotiate. Guthrum swore to leave Wessex and gave hostages as assurance. This time, however, Alfred wanted a stronger guarantee. Guthrum agreed to swear the oath on a holy ring. This was a solemn practice among the Vikings, and the ring used on this occasion has been identified as a Ring of Thor, a large gold band worn on the chieftain's arm, used by the Danes themselves in the exchanging of oaths. Nevertheless, Alfred's effort at appealing to Viking piety proved useless. Guthrum did not keep to his vow. Perhaps the Viking leader was adopting the advice of Odin from the sayings of the High One. If there's a man whom you don't trust, but from whom you want nothing but good, speak fairly to him, but think falsely. Guthrum and his men murdered their West Saxon hostages, then slipped away by night to Exeter. The fleet mentioned earlier was at this time destroyed in a storm off the coast of Swanage. This resulted in the loss of some 120 ships, a serious blow to Guthrum's efforts. Following the storm, Alfred and his forces encamped before Exeter. The king refused to attack the town to dislodge the invaders, but the Saxons were well positioned, and Guthrum was unable to resupply his army. Once again, the two sides came to terms. Having terrorized Wessex for more than a year, Guthrum finally withdrew in August 877. Meanwhile, discontent was brewing among the West Saxons. Many were frustrated with Alfred's handling of the Viking menace. The Archbishop of Canterbury wrote to the Pope, complaining of the King's practice of paying off the Danes. Recently, some historians have suggested that high-ranking members of the West Saxon nobility may have even tried to depose Alfred. This may be why the kingdom was so woefully unprepared when Guthrum attacked again. The king was celebrating Christmas at Chippenham when the Danes arrived and began spreading havoc. The Vikings had executed the maneuver brilliantly, achieving total surprise. 
And if, in fact, Alfred's regime was collapsing and a coup was in progress, this would have left the king and his inner circle all the more vulnerable. The surprise of the attack, along possibly with the revolt of the West Saxon nobility, left Alfred no option but to retreat into the forest with his family and his personal retinue of warriors and followers. Alfred made the difficult journey through the woods of Somerset. He and his companions were reduced to living off what they could forage and hunt. Throughout the bitter winter months, they lived as fugitives. Asser describes the virtual chaos of this period. By strength of arms, the Vikings forced many Saxons to sail overseas through both poverty and fear, and very nearly all the inhabitants of that region submitted to their authority. Alfred was determined to bounce back from this defeat. After Easter, 878, he established a fortress at Athelney amidst the Somerset Marshes. From here, he dispatched intelligence-gathering missions, trying to rouse the spirits of his people and to discover who would rally to his call against the enemy. He also sent bands of warriors to execute hit-and-run raids on the Vikings, who weren't numerous enough to control the whole of the territory. In May, 878, with spring turning the world green again, Alfred departed Athelney and rode to Egbert's Stone, east of Selwood, in a great expanse of woodland. Here the king met with those Shire forces on whose support he could still rely. Asser describes the relief of the West Saxons at the sight of their king. Despair had been widespread in Wessex, but now here was Alfred, alive and rallying his men to fight back. His intelligence sound and his army assembled, Alfred now acted decisively. The king marched out with his men. Guthrum, an excellent commander in his own right, was well aware of Alfred's movements. The Viking leader prepared his own forces to deal with the West Saxon counteroffensive. It was Guthrum who selected the site of the battle, positioning his forces on a hilltop surrounded by ditches. This would oblige Alfred to fight uphill, and also would prevent the Vikings from being outflanked. The West Saxons now arrived at Eddington in Wiltshire. Here, they met Guthrum and his Viking army. Battle began. Joanna Arman writes that despite television portrayals, Saxons and Vikings used similar weapons and equipment. Large, rounded shields with metal bosses were held in front to form a hopefully impenetrable wall. Swords were high-status weapons owned only by the very wealthy. Most men would have used a long spear, stabbing with it over the shield wall in an effort to penetrate enemy ranks. As the shield walls met, both sides would have hacked and stabbed at one another, trying to exploit gaps in the opponent's formation. Asser describes the engagement. When the next morning dawned, Alfred moved his forces and came to a place called Eddington, and fighting fiercely with a compact shield wall against the entire Viking army, he persevered resolutely for a long time. At length, he gained the victory through God's will. He destroyed the Vikings with great slaughter and pursued those who fled as far as the stronghold, hacking them down. Max Adams writes that Alfred's advantages lay in his command of an army defending its homeland and in the tactical superiority of Anglo-Saxon open field warfare against a marine assault force honed to perfection in the art of raiding. Alfred pursued the defeated Danes all the way to their fortress at Chippenham. The West Saxons seized the enemy's livestock and settled in for a siege. After a fortnight, the Vikings capitulated. Guthrum surrendered entirely on Alfred's terms. The Vikings gave hostages. Alfred gave none. The invaders also promised to evacuate Wessex immediately. The terms were sealed three weeks later near Athelney when Guthrum and his leading men submitted to baptism as Christians. No doubt, from the perspective of the West Saxons, the ceremony was a powerful symbol of Christian triumph over Danish heathenism. This was a dramatic turning point. Asser tells us that never before had the Vikings made such a capitulation. 
Alfred's triumph at Eddington achieved nothing less than the salvation of his kingdom. He'd been on the verge of losing everything, but this victory restored his position. No doubt Alfred understood that the Viking offensive was aimed at nothing less than the total conquest of Wessex. He knew that his only option was to fight and win a complete victory. The actual course of the battle remains obscure to historians, but certainly Alfred and his men rose to the occasion. It's possible that the West Saxons had the numerical advantage over Guthrum's army, as the Viking forces appear to have been fewer than during previous attacks. After the decisive West Saxon victory at Eddington, the Viking army withdrew from Chippenham. The following year, they returned to East Anglia, where they settled and shared out the land. This marks the final stage in the establishment of the Danelaw, the Viking-ruled territories of England. No longer content to simply extract tribute from the local populations, the Danes now tried to enforce their own political rule. Total subjugation of England proved impossible, so they contented themselves to consolidating their hold of eastern and northern portions. Distinctly Danish political structures would leave a lasting if subtle influence in these regions. Meanwhile, Alfred's victory at Eddington marked the beginning of a period of respite for the Kingdom of Wessex, which would last throughout the 880s. Alfred took full advantage of this situation. He recognized that his kingdom had not been prepared for the ravages of the Danes. At once, he implemented programs of military, cultural, and civil reform that transformed and strengthened Wessex. This period proved that Alfred was not only a capable commander, but a truly wise and creative ruler. His innovations would not only fortify his people against future Viking aggression, but elevate the intellectual and spiritual lives of the West Saxons. On November 24, 885, a Viking army under a Danish leader called Siegfried sailed up before the walls of Paris. By now, the Danes expected little resistance from the Carolingians, and they likely expected a quick surrender. The next day, Siegfried met with Jocelyn, the Bishop of Paris. Siegfried demanded that his Vikings be allowed passage upstream, where they could plunder the countryside of France. In return, Siegfried swore to leave Paris unmolested. Think of the horrors that your people will endure, said Siegfried, if you refuse to comply with my terms. The Viking chieftain was amazed when this churchman flatly refused his demands. I have been made responsible for the defense of this city by King Charles, said the bishop, and I will not betray his trust. This Charles referenced by Jocelyn was Charles the Fat. Charles had done a poor job in defending France from Viking attacks, so the stakes were all the higher for Paris. The citizens knew well they could expect little support from their emperor. What treatment would you deserve, the bishop asked Siegfried, if you were entrusted with a city and allowed an enemy to pass unmolested? Siegfried replied, I should deserve that my head be cut off and thrown to the dogs. Nevertheless, if you do not give in to my demand, I must tell you that tomorrow our war machines will destroy you with poisoned arrows. You will be prey of famine and pestilence, and these evils will renew themselves every year." Siegfried had hoped to easily frighten Jocelyn into compliance. He was disappointed. Anticipating future Viking attacks, the bishop had spent years strengthening the defenses of Paris. In an age of corruption and cowardice among the Carolingian authorities, Jocelyn was a bishop committed to the defense of his people and his city. Paris sat on the Ile de la Cite, a long slender island in the Seine. Strong walls protected the island, making it a difficult target for the Vikings. A bridge called the Grand Pont joined the city to the north bank of the river, guarded by a partially built stone tower. Another, smaller bridge, the Petit Pont, joined the city to the south bank with a wooden tower standing in defense. These two bridges totally controlled traffic on the river. To continue with their plundering expedition, the Vikings would have to overcome these fortifications. <laughs> 
The bishop was not the only resolute leader in Paris. Count Odo, son of Robert the Strong, led the military operations against the Danes. Odo represented the tough crop of Frankish nobles stepping up to fill the void of leadership left by the failing Carolingian kings. Odo's garrison contained no more than 200 soldiers, but like the bishop, Odo was determined. In the face of impossible odds, courageous leadership can go a long way. Mongonels and Ballistas equipped the walls of Paris, giving the defenders a fighting chance against the siege equipment of the Danes. We are unsure as to the exact size of Siegfried's army, but Christian chroniclers recall that it was enormous. Historians today estimate that the Danish ships numbered around 300, and their army was probably composed of thousands or even tens of thousands of men. At dawn, Siegfried began his assault. The chronicler Abo of Saint-Germain says the city resounded with clamor. The people were aroused, the bridges trembled, all came together to defend the tower. There, Odo, his brother Robert, and the Count Ragnar distinguished themselves for their bravery. Inspired by their commanders, the Christians fought hard. The bishop himself planted a crucifix on the city walls and personally used a bow to launch arrows at enemy troops. For Jocelyn, the desperate circumstances overrode his priestly vow against shedding blood. As night fell, the Danes withdrew, dragging their dead along with them. Through the hours of darkness, Odo and the bishop oversaw repairs to the damaged tower. The Franks added an extra story, and when the Danes awoke, they found that the tower stood even higher than it had yesterday. Now the Vikings tried to mine the tower's foundations. The Franks countered this by pouring boiling pitch and oil down onto them. The shrieks of the Danish miners echoed hideously, with some of them tearing off the skin of their own scalps as they burned to death. From the walls, the Christians cheered. Defeated, the Danes skulked away to their camp, where they were now assailed by the jeers and mockery of their wives and concubines. Siegfried was enraged and determined to avenge this humiliation. The Danes gave up on the idea of a quick victory. Their ire roused by the doggedness of the Franks, they committed to a long siege. In January, Siegfried launched a three-pronged attack. One division of the Viking army attacked the stone tower on the north bank, while their comrades assaulted the city from their ships. The Danes tried to fill in the moat, using logs, straw, and even dead animals and captives. For three days, the Vikings struggled to move their siege towers into position, but the Franks sallied forth from the city and managed to burn two Danish engines. A few Vikings broke into Paris, only to be slaughtered by the citizens. After suffering another humiliating defeat, the attackers benefited from the weather. In February, the Seine flooded and surging waters smashed the Petit Pont. During the night, Bishop Jocelyn dispatched a band of Franks to occupy the wooden tower so that the bridge could be repaired. But Siegfried spotted this maneuver and quickly attacked the tower. From the walls of Paris, the Franks could only watch helplessly as their brave comrades were massacred on the south bank. The Vikings threw the bodies in the river and burned the wooden tower to the ground. Siegfried could now accomplish his original goal. He could now move his army past Paris to plunder the French countryside, but the proud Viking had no intention of letting the stubborn Parisians off the hook. With part of his force, he maintained the siege, while the rest of his men plundered Chartres to the west and Evreux to the south. By spring of 886, disease and hunger plagued the defenders of Paris. The cemeteries could no longer hold their dead. The Franks suffered a terrible blow when their beloved Bishop Jocelyn fell ill and died on April 16. With a small band of followers, Count Odo struck out on a secret mission to personally plead with the Emperor to bring his army to Paris. Charles replied with non-committal assurances. Disappointed, Odo returned at once to rejoin the beleaguered Parisians. Abo describes what happened when Odo returned from this desperate errand. 
One day, Odo suddenly appeared in splendor in the midst of three bands of warriors. The sun made his armor glisten and greeted him before it illuminated the country around. The Parisians saw their beloved chief at a distance, but the enemy, hoping to prevent his gaining entrance to the tower, crossed the Seine and took up their position on the bank. Nevertheless, Odo, his horse at a gallop, got past the Northmen and reached the tower, whose gates were opened to him. Finally, in October, the Archbishop of Reims warned the Emperor that if he lost Paris, he would lose his kingdom. At last, Charles raised an army and marched. But when he arrived at Paris, much to the dismay of the defenders, the Emperor simply opened negotiations with the besiegers. Incredibly, Charles granted the Vikings exactly what they had originally wanted, permission to sail past Paris and ravage the Burgundians. The Count of Burgundy had been disloyal to the Carolingian regime, and Charles didn't mind punishing him with Viking violence. The defenders of Paris were disgusted. They refused to honor the terms of Charles the Fat. By now, the Petit Pont had been repaired, and the Parisians blocked the Danish ships from advancing. The Vikings had to drag their vessels overland and relaunch them upstream of Paris. As a final demonstration of his weakness, Charles paid the Danes a hefty 700 pounds of silver in return for peace. The outcome of the Siege of Paris destroyed what little credibility still clung to Charles the Fat. During a council at Frankfurt, the East Franks deposed Charles and elected his nephew, Arnulf, in his place. Abandoned even by his close retainers, Charles retired to a private estate in the Black Forest, where he died in January 888. Rumor held that Arnulf had ordered his uncle strangled. At last, the ancient empire of Charlemagne collapsed completely. While the East Franks recognized Arnulf, Burgundy, Italy, and Provence all elected their own rulers. Meanwhile, the West Franks crowned as their king, Odo, the hero of Paris. In Odo, the Vikings would face a very different sort of opponent. Over the coming years, men like Odo and Arnulf would fundamentally shift the trajectory of the Viking Age in France. But we'll leave that for a future video. Once Vikings entrenched themselves on the River Loire in France, it was only a matter of time before they pressed farther south to explore the wealthy Muslim holdings in the Iberian Peninsula, that is modern-day Spain and Portugal. The riches of Cordoba were a tempting prospect. In the 9th century, the Umayyad Emirate of Cordoba was the westernmost stronghold of Muslim civilization. The bulk of the Iberian Peninsula was under Muslim rule. Only in the rugged Cantabrian mountains of the northwest did Christian rule endure. Cordoba, with a population of some 200,000, was by far the largest and richest city in Western Europe. But Muslim Spain would be no easy pickings. The emirate boasted a strong and well-organized military of infantry and light cavalry. During this period, the emir's armory manufactured 20,000 arrows every month. Both infantry and cavalry wore mail or scale armor, as well as iron helmets, which only wealthier Vikings could afford. The emirate's leading warriors were the Mamluks, slave soldiers raised from boyhood to be the emir's elite fighting force. Cordoba's standing army could react more quickly to a Viking attack than the levies of France or England. Indeed, the Iberian Peninsula as a whole was primed for war. In the face of the Muslim military powerhouse to its south, the Christian kingdom of Astorias had to maintain a high level of combat readiness. The poor but determined Christian states of the Iberian mountains also posed a considerable challenge to Viking raiders. In the east, Muslim geographers described the Vikings they met in Russia as Al Rus. In Spain, they called them Al Majus. The term was not created for the Vikings, but for the Zoroastrians of Persia, for whom fire was a primary symbol. Arab writers misinterpreted the cremation in Viking funerary rites as fire worship. Their religion is that of the Magi, wrote the chronicler Al-Watwat, and they burn their dead with fire, 
The geographer Ibn Sayyid offered his own interpretation of fire worship among northern peoples. Nothing to them seems more important than fire, for the cold in their lands is severe. History records 844 as the year of the first Viking raid on the Iberian Peninsula. From the Loire, a Viking band sailed south to the Gironde. Charles the Bald, the king of West Francia, was distracted by a dispute with Pippin of Aquitaine. And so the Vikings managed to sail up the river Garon as far as Toulouse. They moved on to plunder the coast of Galicia and Asturias. When they attacked La Coruña, they encountered a strong Christian force led by King Ramiro I. Ramiro's troops fought cohesively and effectively. Galician ballistas, giant crossbows, inflicted serious casualties on the Vikings. The Christians captured 70 of the Norsemen's longships, and Ramiro ordered them burned on the beach. The surviving Norsemen sailed farther south down the coast of modern Portugal, which at the time was controlled by Umayyad Cordoba. The Vikings landed near Lisbon in August. Arab chroniclers state that their fleet numbered around 100 vessels, which means that it must have been almost twice that large when it set out from the Loire. For 13 days, the Vikings plundered lands around Lisbon. The Umayyad governor of Lisbon dispatched messengers to Cordoba to raise the alarm. The emir, Abd al-Rahman II, put the governors of the coastal districts on alert. Meanwhile, the Vikings sacked Cadiz and the fortress of Medina Sidonia. They next traveled on the Guadalquivir River into the Emir's wealthiest districts. Cordoba itself lay in their path. On September 29, the Vikings established a base on Isla Menor, an island in the Guadalquivir. From here, they began to systematically ravage the region. On October 1st, the fleet continued upriver another 15 miles until they reached Sevilla. To these Vikings, Sevilla must have been a tantalizing sight. Aside from Cordoba, Sevilla was the greatest and wealthiest city in Iberia. It was well beyond anything the Norsemen would have found in England or France, where the towns were poor and small. Since the decline of the Roman Empire and the establishment of Arab control of the Mediterranean Sea, Sevilla, by contrast, benefited from the vast trade networks secured by the great Muslim conquests. As they approached this magnificent city, the Vikings must have been giddy imagining the loot within its walls. When the townspeople saw the Vikings disembarking on the riverbank, they sallied out to challenge them. This was brave, but ultimately foolish. The Vikings were experienced warriors, and when they attacked, the townsmen panicked and scattered. In the turmoil, the Vikings rushed into the city, where they indulged in a week's worth of unhindered plundering. Many of the town's people were killed or taken captive, though a large number of them fled into the mountains. Once they finished looting Sevilla, the Vikings returned loaded with booty and prisoners to their camp at Isla Menor. From here, they continued to dispatch raiding parties throughout the region. Days later, they journeyed back to Sevilla, hoping to capture returning townspeople. But the city was still mostly deserted. A small group took refuge in a mosque, where the Vikings slaughtered them. The sheer boldness of the attack on Sevilla took Umayyad Cordoba off guard. But the emir finally did organize a military response. With the help of catapults, the Cordoban army drove the Vikings out of Sevilla. Umayyad detachments began ambushing Viking raiding parties. The emir's men captured a large number of Norse ships, killing all the raiders on board. As the weeks wore on, the Umayyads continued to pressure the Vikings, making their position increasingly untenable. In early November, the Muslims ambushed the bulk of the Vikings near Sevilla, killing many of them, including their leader. To celebrate, the emir dispatched the severed heads of the Viking commander and some 200 of his men to the Berber emir in Tangier. The surviving Vikings were now trapped on their island base. They negotiated with the Umayyads, exchanging their prisoners for passage out of Spain. The remnant of the Norse fleet passed Lisbon as it headed back for the Loire. Historian John Haywood estimates that less than a quarter of the original expedition returned home. From their showdown with the Astorians to their audacious sacking of Sevilla, the first Viking attack on Iberia proved to be a deadly caper marked by the reckless adventurism that characterizes the Viking Age.
In the aftermath of this jarring episode, the Emir took steps to bolster his defenses. Lookout posts were established on the Atlantic coast, and a new armory was installed at Sevilla. The Emir also organized a fleet to patrol his coastline. The Muslim warships were large, swift sailing galleys. They bore crews of 50 to 100 sailors and warriors. The Emir placed catapults on his vessels to counter any future Viking raiding parties. But the most famous Viking attack on Iberia was launched by two of history's most renowned Viking commanders, Bjorn Ironsides and Hastein. Later legend cast Bjorn as the son of Ragnar Lodbrok, a semi-mythical figure of the Nordic sagas. As a child, Bjorn's mother was said to have imbued him with magic invulnerability to wounds, earning him the title Ironsides. Hastein was one of the 9th century's most well-traveled Viking leaders, ending his career as the final great opponent of Alfred the Great in England. In 859, Hastein and Bjorn set out from a base on the Loire with a fleet of some 62 ships bound for the Iberian coastline. First, they tried to attack Galicia and Astorias, but the Christians confronted them with a resistance that proved too strong. So they moved on to plunder the Emir's western coastline, where initially they found easier pickings. But the Emir's fleet responded quickly, capturing two Viking ships already loaded with plunder and prisoners. With Muslim ships in pursuit, Bjorn and Hastein made a drive up the Guadalquivir, perhaps intent on attacking Sevilla. When the Emir's ships attacked with incendiary weapons, the Vikings lost several ships to fire and narrowly escaped. The usual Viking tactic was to avoid strong resistance and look for an easier target, and Bjorn and Hastein did just that. They moved on to Algeciras, near Gibraltar, where they launched a surprise attack. The inhabitants were completely overwhelmed. The Vikings sacked the town and burned the chief mosque. Hoping to find more plunder, Bjorn and Hastein now crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and entered the Mediterranean. They struck the African coast, attacking Nakor. They made short work of local troops and then plundered freely for a week. They captured the harem of a local emir, which was later ransomed by the emir of Cordoba himself. From Africa, the Vikings veered back to Muslim Spain, plundering the coast of Mercia and the Balearic Islands. From here, they moved back to plunder parts of France before setting up a winter camp on an island in Camargue, a large delta of the River Rhone. In the spring, Hastein and Bjorn sailed some 100 miles up the Rhone, plundering Nîmes, Arles, and Valence as they went. But the Franks defeated them in battle, and so they decided to head back out into the open sea. According to legend, during this time, Hastein and Bjorn sacked Rome, but this is a myth and did not in fact occur historically. Instead, they moved along the Tuscan coast, plundering as they went. In 861, they crossed the Straits of Gibraltar, intent on returning home. They didn't know that the Emir of Cordoba had prepared an ambush for them. In the narrow passage of the Straits, the Emir's fleet waited for them, attacking the Vikings as they made the crossing. A desperate battle ensued, in which the Muslims emerged victorious. The Viking fleet was devastated. Of Hastein and Bjorn's original 60 ships, only 20 escaped. Ever undaunted, Bjorn and Hastein continued raiding with their remnant fleet. Just before they exited Spanish waters, they attacked the tiny Christian kingdom of Navarre, sacking the town of Pamplona. Amazingly, they managed to capture King Garcia I. For his ransom, the Vikings collected an incredible 70,000 gold dinars. Thus, despite the final disaster of their expedition, the survivors of Bjorn and Hastein's band returned to the Loire in 862, very rich indeed. It's one of those twists of fate that seem to characterize Viking history. The daring nature of Bjorn and Hastein's expedition earned them fame that endures today. But the cost had been high. Less than a third of the original force survived to return home. Future Viking leaders took this into account. They continued to raid Spain, but in the future avoided the Mediterranean. Local naval forces could too easily ambush a Viking fleet trying to negotiate the narrow Straits of Gibraltar. 
After this operation, Hastein and Bjorn went their separate ways. Bjorn returned to Denmark, hoping to use his wealth to gain the throne, but he lost his wealth in a shipwreck and died in Phrygia. Wisdom is the highest virtue, and it has within it four other virtues. One is caution, the second moderation, the third courage, and the fourth justice. Wisdom renders those who love it wise and honorable, and temperate, and patient, and just, and it fills him who loves it with every good quality. This is from Alfred the Great's translation of the Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius. The 880s were years of great activity for Alfred but also years of reflection and study. The king spent this period bolstering the military defenses of his kingdom, as well as reading and translating the works of thinkers like Boethius. Alfred sought to instill wisdom not only in himself, but in his subjects as well. He knew that his people needed to be strong not only in body, but in mind and spirit. Alfred also spent this period strengthening bonds with his neighbor, Mercia. The crown of Wessex had deep ties to the Mercians. Alfred was married to a Mercian lady, Ellswith, and she'd brought with her many family members and clerics from her homeland. Historians have long noted that the 880s and 890s particularly saw Alfred's court filled with Mercians. It was at this time that Athelred, Lord of the Mercians, became a fixture at the court of Wessex, joining the king on numerous military campaigns. The two rulers got to know one another well, both on the warpath and in the council chamber. Alfred arranged for his eldest daughter, Athelflaed, to marry the valiant young lord of Mercia. By the time Athelflaed set off for Mercia in 886 to begin her life as a married woman, she was already well acquainted with her husband Athelred and confident that unity of purpose existed between him and her father. Athelflaed and her brother Edward would carry forward Alfred's dynasty. As children, they were educated in the rich literary traditions of the Anglo-Saxons. The heroic poetry that had thrilled Alfred as a youngster would have also been inculcated in the young Athelflaed and Edward. This instilled in them a sense of the majesty of their own royal line. Bishop Asser tells us of Alfred's legendary ancestry, which even included ancient Germanic Scandinavian gods like Odin. Alfred's younger children and other Anglo-Saxon youngsters would benefit from an even more extensive education with the establishment of Alfred's royal school. Here, scholars taught classical Latin texts meant to edify young Anglo-Saxons with high wisdom. Despite these enlightened pursuits, Saxon domains remained harried by violence. Even after 878, Viking raids still continued to be a problem for Alfred's kingdom, though on a mostly small scale. Guthrum, the Danish king of East Anglia, had been a quiet neighbor since his defeat at Eddington, content to abide by his treaty with Alfred. But in 890, Guthrum died, and this created an opening for other, more ambitious adventurers. Vikings who had been active on the continent since 879 suffered a major defeat at the Battle of the River Dial in 891. A famine the following year drove them to return to the coast of Flanders. From there, they struck at England, landing on the coast and attempting to penetrate a sparsely defended, thickly forested area known as the Great Wood. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle recounts this attack of 892. In this year, the great Viking army came up the estuary of the Lyman with 250 ships. This estuary is in eastern Kent, at the east end of the Great Wood. The wood from east to west is 120 miles long or longer and 30 miles wide. The river flows out of that forest. They rowed their ships up the river as far as the forest, four miles from the outer part of the estuary, and there they attacked a fortification located in the marshland. A few commoners were present inside, and it was only half made. Then shortly afterwards, Hastein came up the Thames estuary with 80 ships and made a fortification for himself at Milton and the other Viking army, made one at Appledore. This passage captures the brilliance of the Viking strategy 
two separate naval forces penetrated the kingdom by river at a remote, heavily forested location, overcoming light local resistance and establishing two separate bases. The army, as the chronicler noted, was under the leadership of Hastein, a charismatic Norse adventurer who would replace Guthrum as King Alfred's arch opponent. Hastein's backstory has all the makings of a Viking legend. He'd previously raided in Spain and North Africa and even attempted an attack on Rome. Now, he had his sights set on Wessex. The chronicle describes how Alfred handled this sudden assault. And then King Alfred assembled his army and advanced so that he encamped between the two Viking armies at a point where he had the best access both to the forest stronghold at Appledore and the river stronghold at Milton, so that he could reach either one if they chose to make for any open country. Then the Vikings set out afterwards through the forest in small bands and riding companies along whatever side was undefended by the English army and they were also pursued by other troops almost every day, either by day or by night, both from the English army and also from the boroughs. Alfred's intention was to prevent the Danes from freely raiding throughout his kingdom or from breaking out of their forts. He dispatched his own raiding parties to harass both Viking armies and to intercept their communications. We can see now the benefits of Alfred's borough system. Neither Danish army could move about as it wished, Everywhere they went, they were confronted by strong local forces, and the towns were well defended. Easy plunder was scarcely to be found. After a few months, Alfred opened negotiations with Hastein. Accompanied by Lord Athelred, the king met with the Viking leader, and the two parties agreed to terms. Hastein swore to depart the kingdom and offered hostages. Two of these hostages were Hastein's own sons, both were baptized, with Alfred and Athelred acting as their godfathers. The Chronicle even tells us that Alfred paid the Vikings, quote, a good deal of money. It seems unbelievable that the victor of Eddington would return to the hated old practice of paying Danegeld, and yet this appears to be exactly what happened. In assessing this moment in Alfred's career, we should consider the dangerous situation he was facing. His victory at Eddington had been a close-run affair, and indeed, he'd nearly lost his kingdom. Now, for the first time in years, two powerful Viking forces were on his doorstep. Alfred was surely nervous about the prospect of another existential crisis for Wessex. Perhaps he decided to try for an easy solution and see if he could convert Hastein to another Guthrum. Post-878, Guthrum's rule in East Anglia had been mostly stabilizing for Wessex. By having Guthrum's son baptized, the king may have hoped to recreate such a favorable situation. As it turned out, Alfred would be disappointed. Hastein crossed the Thames, settled with his army at Benfleet in Essex, and at once resumed pillaging Alfred's lands. At Easter of 893, the other, larger Viking army at Appledore set off in their ships to join Hastein in Essex. Alfred was preparing to set out against the enemy when the worst possible news arrived. In the weeks after Easter, a third Viking army composed of Danes from Northumbria and East Anglia landed at Exeter. Alfred set off to meet this new invasion while his son, Prince Edward, marched to confront the Appledore Vikings. Although he was only about 20 years old, Edward was expected to lead troops in the field. The Chronicle of Elderman Athelward recounts the battle that followed. And after Easter of that year, the Viking army, which had arrived from Gaulish parts, broke camp, and by following the hiding places of a certain vast forest, which is commonly called the Great Wood, they got as far as western England and devastated the provinces thereabout. These matters were made known to Prince Edward, the son of King Alfred. He had been conducting a campaign throughout the southern parts of England, but afterward he was joined by the western English. The engagement took place at Farnham, with the dense throng shrieking with threats. Without delay, the young men attacked with weapons. They were duly liberated by the prince's arrival. The Viking leader was wounded, and the Saxons drove the filthy crowds of his supporters across the River Thames to northern parts. Thus young Edward won his first battle. The Saxons recovered a great deal of booty, and the Vikings fled to Thorny Island. Here, Edward besieged the enemy in their campsite. However, Edward ran into a serious problem. The levies under his command were running short of provisions, and nearing the end of their terms of service, 
They grumbled at the prospect of a long siege. Many of these men were due to return to their garrison assignments at various boroughs. The situation was saved by the arrival of Lord Athelred with a Mercian army from London. Edward and Athelred opened negotiations and the Vikings agreed to depart the area. Athelred now further demonstrated his capabilities. Leading a combined force of Mercians and West Saxons, he surprised Hastine at his base of Benfleet. The Chronicle provides a memorable account of this battle. And then the English arrived and put the Viking army to flight and stormed the fortification and seized everything that was inside in the way of goods, women and children as well. And they brought everything to London and then they either broke up or burned all the ships and Hastine's two sons and his wife were brought to the king. Hastine's fortress was destroyed at Benfleet, but he managed to slip away with most of his men. This was the Norseman's most remarkable talent, making him an enduring thorn in the side of the Anglo-Saxons. Hastine established a new fortified camp at Shubury. Then he made a dash across England for the Welsh borders to establish camp at Buddington in the Welsh hills. This was a remarkable trek across hostile territory in which the Vikings managed to avoid detection by Saxon garrisons, a testament to the mobility and effectiveness of the Norsemen. Also, this placed Hastine very near to the Northumbrian East Anglian Viking army confronting King Alfred at Exeter. But as Hastine began pillaging Wales, the Northumbrian East Anglian invaders suddenly abandoned their position and returned home. Alfred's operations had been effective. The Vikings simply realized that they would not be able to make any headway with the royal army in the field. This development eased pressures on the Anglo-Saxons. Now Lord Athelred organized for a decisive strike against Hastine. He was joined by two important West Saxon eldermen, Athelm of Somerset and Athelm of Wiltshire, as well as substantial Welsh contingents. Mercia and Wales had often been at odds, but fear of the Vikings brought them together now in a firm alliance. For weeks, the Anglo-Welsh coalition besieged Hastine's Vikings at Buddington. Unable to dispatch foraging parties, the Danes quickly began to starve and were reduced to eating their horses. Hastine decided to attempt a breakout across the river. This resulted in a bloody battle. Casualties were high on both sides. Danish losses were higher. Ultimately, the Anglo-Saxons and their Welsh allies were victorious. Characteristically, Hastine and many of his men managed to escape, but this was the end of the Viking leader's legendary career. His forces retreated into East Anglia, and from there Hastine disappears from history. We can't be sure of his fate, but it's possible that he simply retired. By now, he was probably in his 50s, and a wealthy man after a lifetime of raiding across France and the Mediterranean. Thus, as 893 drew to a close, Alfred the Great and his allies had defeated a dangerous opponent, though not without months of hard fighting. This demonstrated the effectiveness of Alfred's military reforms. The Saxons had been unable to prevent the Vikings from penetrating their territory, but Alfred's system of forts had seriously hindered Viking movement and dramatically reduced opportunities for plunder. Villagers found refuge in the fortified boroughs, and local levies effectively harassed and pursued Danish raiding parties. Far from the lucrative expeditions of the past, the Vikings found this war to be grueling, leaving them with little but battle wounds to show for their trouble. By now, Alfred was an old man and took a less active role in the campaigning. His son-in-law, Athelred of Mercia, provided crucial leadership in some of the most difficult fighting, and the king's son and heir, Edward, also proved his worth. The West Saxons cooperated smoothly with the Mercians, and the Welsh as well, and multiple Christian armies moved to where they were needed throughout the crisis. At the same time, the situation revealed limitations in the Anglo-Saxon military establishment. Prince Edward nearly saw his victory at Farnham collapse into defeat when his troops threatened to disperse because they had nearly completed their period of service and were running low on provisions. One also might question the continued tendency to negotiate with Viking forces. In acknowledging the shortcomings of Alfred's armies, we must also take into account the remarkable competence of their opponents. These Vikings were no disorganized plunderers, but highly efficient, swift, and elusive invasion units. The Danes continued to make good use of the waterways, often evading Saxon counteroffensives. Hastine himself was the sort of daring commander to inspire the best in his men and to be a persistent irritant to Alfred and his followers. 
With the death of Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, the Carolingian Empire slipped into crisis. The mid-9th century was a period of civil conflict as the sons of Louis struggled with one another for power, and the empire was ultimately cleaved into three separate entities. The strife proved fertile ground for the seafaring raiders of the north. Penetrating France via the River Seine, Viking commanders such as Ragnar and Eskir plundered all the way up to Paris in the 840s. Askir ravaged and occupied Rouen in 841, and when he returned in 851, Rouen served as a base from which his raiders spread out on foot. Two Viking forces attacked Paris and sacked Chartres in 857. Hastein, who would later become an opponent of Alfred the Great in England, raided up the Seine in 858. The Carolingian government was increasingly incapable of dealing with these devastating assaults. The Norse knew well the situation in the once powerful empire of Charlemagne. The collapse of Carolingian legitimacy meant that local governors no longer derived their authority from the king, but were increasingly becoming autonomous lords in their own right. The people looked to the regional counts for protection, and these counts began to solidify their own geographically determined power bases. Viking violence simply broke the old imperial system, and the counts began working to ensure the loyalty of the local fighting men, the beginning of the feudal relationship. Meanwhile, the Carolingian church all but refused to cooperate with the king. Charles the Bald could not rely on church wealth to finance his troops. Impoverished and unable to field effective armies, the Carolingian kings were reduced to publishing impotent decrees. Crime was rampant and the monarch was issuing proclamations that thieves should be admonished with Christian love to repent, and that punishments should be administered to the guilty, quote, as far as the local officials could remember them. As things grew worse, the kings even asked royal officials to solemnly swear that they themselves would not turn to theft and plunder. All the while, Viking violence made much of the Northwest uninhabitable. The Norse leaders Hastein and Bjorn so ravaged the Cotentin Peninsula that it became a deserted wasteland. From the mists of Norse legend, a man named Rollo emerges and begins to play an important role in these late 9th century events. Dudo, an early chronicler for the Normans, records that Rollo was a Dane, expelled from his home country along with other warlike young men thought to be a threat by the Danish king. Rollo took to the sea and began his career as a Viking raider. In England, he took up with his fellow Danes, who controlled the northern and eastern portions of the island, the Danelaw. Rollo formed a bond with Guthrum, the Viking chieftain who ruled East Anglia. Guthrum had given up his life of plundering after he was defeated by Alfred the Great at the Battle of Eddington. Baptized, Guthrum took the Christian name Athelstan and kept his treaties with King Alfred. Dudo writes that Rollo and Guthrum, both of Danish origin, became close allies. No region brings forth extraordinary men, and ones actively instructed in arms, more than does the kingdom of the Danes, said Guthrum. Perhaps from Guthrum, Rollo began to gain an understanding of the success he might achieve not in raiding the Christians, but in forming associations with them. Dudo's account of Rollo, while compelling, is not uncontested in our scant sources for the mysterious Viking. In Snorri's saga of Harald Fairhair, Rollo is Norwegian, not Danish, and is described as being so large that no horse could carry him. Therefore, he is called Rollo the Walker. So the founding figure of the Normans, the apex cavalryman of the 11th century, is cast here as a man with no use for horses. Rollo plundered France as ruthlessly as any other Norse chieftain. Some time between 876 and 886, Rollo led his Vikings before the French city of Rouen. The Franks who defended Rouen fought on horseback, but Rollo was determined to undercut their advantage. The ruse he devised might be considered an appropriate prelude to the famous cunning of the Normans. He had his Viking crew dig pits between the river Seine and the city walls, which were then concealed with turf. Once the battle was underway, the Vikings pretended to retreat to their ships. The Franks gave pursuit on their horses, at which point they fell straight into the trap set by the Norsemen. Rollo and his men then entered Rouen unopposed, 
In 911, King Charles the Simple invited Rollo to the negotiating table. Historian Robert Ferguson says that Charles formally recognized Rollo's right to rule a large area of northwest France, bluntly described as too often laid waste by Hastine and by you. In return, Rollo and his Norsemen would convert to Christianity and assist Charles in the defense of his kingdom. The pact was sealed by a marriage between Rollo and Charles's daughter, Gisla. Dudo includes two anecdotes that emphasize the ideal of the independent and proud Viking warrior. Apparently, once the agreement had been made between the Carolingians and the Norsemen, Rollo was told that he must now demonstrate his submission to the king by kissing Charles's foot. Rollo refused. I will never bow my knees at the knees of any man, and no man's foot will I kiss. He commanded one of his men to perform the gesture for him. The Viking came forward, seized the king's foot, and flung him over so that Charles went tumbling backward. This provoked laughter among the Norsemen, but outrage among the Franks. The story seems like a campfire tale passed down among the Normans to remind themselves of their superior prowess, but it does illustrate the undeniable reality that Charles's grant was, as Robert Ferguson calls it, a concession to reality. Dudo describes another occasion when one of Charles's emissaries asked a group of Vikings by what title their leader was known. The Vikings answered, by none, since we are all equals. This emphasizes the old equality of the Viking warband. Warriors were equal to one another, but agreed to follow a commander who demonstrated competence. The emissary then asked if the Vikings would be willing to swear loyalty to Charles the Simple in return for lands and titles. The Norsemen replied, We will never subjugate ourselves to anyone, nor cling to anyone's service, nor take favors from anyone. The favor that would please us best is the one that we will claim for ourselves by force of arms and in the hardship of battle. Again, coming from a chronicle commissioned by Rollo's grandson, we see here depicted an old ideal that the Normans continued to prize. Two more grants of land followed. As a result, Rollo's territory roughly corresponded to modern-day Normandy. A charter from 918 describes the grant as being made to Rollo and his companions for the defense of the kingdom. It seems strange to solve the problem of chronic brigandage by handing territory to a pillager, and yet Charles's treaty with Rollo seems to have accomplished this goal. Robert Ferguson compares the granting of Normandy to Alfred the Great's agreement with Guthrum. In both cases, a Christian ruler sought to neutralize an enemy by legitimizing his power and bringing him into the Christian fold. In their own way, both succeeded. Once Rollo was established as Duke of Normandy, Viking attacks up the Seine came to an end. Rollo made sure of that. A volatile region was stabilized, and Paris was secured. In 923, Rollo and his men fought alongside the Carolingians in a military campaign led by King Charles. Meanwhile, according to Dudo, Rollo divided the land among his followers by measure and rebuilt everything that had been deserted, and restored it by restocking it with his own warriors and with peoples from abroad. Rollo seems to have taken his role as the king's man seriously and worked to restore law and order to Normandy. We don't know how Rollo organized his administration, if we can use that term at this point, whether he ruled more as a Viking chieftain or as a Frankish count. Perhaps he was in some parts both. There is evidence, however, that he ruled mostly as a Frankish autocrat. He passed laws making robbery and violence punishable by death, a far stricter sentence than was imposed in Carolingian lands. This foreshadows the destiny of Normandy, which would become the most well-ordered region in France. In one account, Rollo decrees that farm implements should be left out in the field overnight. One farmer's wife hid her husband's tools and then reported them stolen. Rollo at once replaced the man's equipment and then began investigating the theft. However, when the Duke discovered what had really happened, he had the offending woman scourged until she confessed. At last, the husband admitted that he'd known the truth all along. Rollo handed down two convictions, the one that you are the head of a woman and ought to have chastised her, the other that you were an accessory to the theft and were unwilling to disclose it. Both the man and his wife were hanged. Dudo claims that this outcome so deterred future thefts that Normandy remained free of petty criminality for a hundred years. <laughs> 
Dudo also recounts that two of King Charles's warriors paid a visit to Rollo's wife Gisla. Gisla entertained the two men in private, and afterward, rumors circulated that Rollo had not consummated his marriage. Suspecting Gisla's visitors of starting the rumors, the Duke executed both men in the public market of Rouen. Today, many question the validity of Rollo's conversion to Christianity. Certainly, his conversion had a political dimension, but to claim that Rollo was entirely cynical in the adoption of his new faith might be to reimagine him as a nihilistic modern. Vikings stood in awe of the supernatural, though there must have been a divide between Rollo's conception of the divine and that of his Frankish partners. He might have perceived himself as holding some sort of dual allegiance. Dudo predictably portrays Rollo as entirely sincere in his conversion, but other chroniclers are not so certain. Adamer of Shaban, writing some 100 years after Rollo's death, described the ruler's final days as a time of religious madness in which Rollo the heathen battled with Rollo the Christian. Seeing that he was dying, Rollo grew terrified of the wrath of Thor and Odin and ordered 100 Christian captives sacrificed to assuage the anger of the old gods. But the ailing ruler next grew afraid that Christ would now condemn him to hell and so he distributed vast quantities of gold and wealth to the churches of his realm. Dudo would never have recalled such uncomfortable incidents, and it's possible that Adamer's tale is either exaggerated or false. But Robert Ferguson says that the story provides a rare and persuasive insight into the violent tensions that could arise when devout men change the object of their devotion as a matter of political convenience. In Rollo's case, they were seemingly mind-wrenching. Some of Rollo's followers refused to convert or return to their previous beliefs after baptism. We have a 10th century letter written by the Archbishop of Rouen to a colleague asking for advice on dealing with apostate heathen converts. Archaeologists have also uncovered 10th century Viking burial sites in Normandy. Edward Gibbon insists that within a couple of generations the conversion was genuine and the sons of Rollo's Vikings forgot Thor and Odin and fully embraced faith in Christ. R. Allen Brown says that the religious revival in Normandy began almost at once and that it was mostly led by the dukes. Rollo's successor, William Longsword, refounded the monastery of Jumiege around 940 and longed to become a monk there himself. His son, Richard the Fearless, restored the Abbey of Saint Juan at Rouen. The monastic life was at the center of the Norman religious revival. From early on, the Normans could relate to the idea of monks as spiritual warriors engaged in a perpetual battle against the forces of darkness through ceaseless prayer. The monk and the knight became the dual arms of the Norman state, and by the 11th century, the abbeys of Normandy would be the most powerful centers of Western Christianity. Now, learn about the Christian descendants of the Vikings, the unconquered Normans. Watch our full-length documentary on the Norman conquest of Sicily. Click on the link on your screen or see the link in the description down below.